Taiwan is gradually lifting its last COVID restrictions, but the pandemic is still impacting people's mental health. An unclear legacy. A new documentary asks how Taiwan has changed eight years after protesters stormed the legislature. A recent U.S.-Taiwan weapons deal is focusing on one of the world's most advanced missile systems. But what is it, and is it a game changer? Plus, age is just a number. The 61-year-old powerlifter breaking records. A warm welcome to Taiwan Plus News. I'm Erica Liu. Vice President Lai Qingde on Thursday said he will stand for leadership of Taiwan's ruling Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP. Lai, who tested positive for COVID-19 on Wednesday, is the first person to declare they are running for DPP chair. President Tsai Ing-wen stepped down as party leader following the DPP's losses in local elections last month. Party members will elect their new chair in January. The next leader will have the task of guiding the party toward the presidential election in just over a year. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken a toll on Taiwan's mental health, with depression and anxiety on the rise. That's according to a new survey by the Taiwan's Mental Health Foundation. John Ventriest spoke to the foundation's head for a closer look at the issue. Taiwan's mental health has seen better days, and COVID-19 is a big reason why. In the latest survey by the Mental Health Foundation conducted this fall, almost 30 percent of respondents said the pandemic has made them more depressed or anxious. That's despite the fact that life in Taiwan has been relatively normal in the past three years compared to other parts of the world. The foundation's head, Hu Haiguo, explains. The people, they still have a high proportion of them have a problem in their business. Their store has to be closed. And also the uh, guest, the customer decreased a lot. So their business becomes slow a lot. And in that condition, about 30% uh, of the you know, general population, they uh, encounter the economic uh, uh, problems. So, and also they do not have no uh, a good outlook in the near future. Overall, the foundation says the state of Taiwan's mental health is acceptable. But what about that 30 percent of people? What can they do if they need help? How good is Taiwan's mental health care system? And are people willing to use it? So the system here for the mental health care is, uh, I would say, it's a satisfactory uh, uh, condition. But the problem is that the people, they do not know at what state they need to see the psychiatrist. So the system is good, it's well functioning. But the people, uh, I will say uh, many people, they are feel resistant to see psychiatrists or uh, uh, they do not know that they can get help from the psychiatrists or the psychologists. Has Taiwan seen similar dips in mental health in past years? It seems yes, and in a predictable cycle, once every four years. So for the Coming to the present election year, people getting anxious, getting more uh, the different uh, opinion, and they have some sort of more argument, and the society becoming more uneasy. So every time at the present election, the mental health index score is becoming lower. So what does the foundation think can be done to help Taiwan's mental health recover as we leave the pandemic behind? For well, the government, I, I would say that uh, uh, there are significant people that have some sort of economic problem. So the government must pay attention to those more, I would say, uh, they are hardworking people. Their income decreased markedly. So the government might pay attention for those uh, people with uh, economic problems. But there are things people experiencing depression and anxiety can do for themselves. The foundation recommends exercise, time in nature, and human interaction. But it also encourages people not to hesitate to seek out mental health care professionals when they need to. Leon Lian and John Van Trieste for Taiwan Plus. 
Police have arrested a man suspected of calling a Taipei legislative candidate and threatening to shoot her. Officers arrested the 65-year-old man late on Wednesday in Kaohsiung, a city in southern Taiwan, 300 kilometers from the capital. The man told police he phoned Taipei candidate Wang Hongwei to complain about her recent speeches. Wang, who belongs to the opposition Kuomintang, had accused the ruling party of harboring links to organized crime. On Tuesday, her team took a call from a man who threatened to shoot Wang if she didn't stop making remarks about gangsters. Police plan to charge the suspect with intimidation. A new documentary by award-winning director Kevin Lee is challenging how people view Taiwan's democracy. The film called Zero to Zero explores how the country's politics have changed since 2014, when student protesters occupied the legislature. Lee spent eight years following the country's lawmakers and filming behind the scenes to produce the documentary. Stash Butler has the story. A pivotal moment in Taiwan's democracy. Demonstrators stormed the national legislature in 2014 to protest a controversial trade pact with China, a move that empowered a new generation of political activists. Named after one of its most memorable symbols, the Sunflower Movement gave rise to a new political party, whose members often clash with veteran politicians. <laughs> But eight years since emerging from the Sunflower Movement, the new power party has only three members in the legislature. And people on the streets of Taipei are not sure what the protests achieved. Now, award-winning director Kevin Lee is asking the same question in a new documentary. Li has spent eight years following Taiwanese lawmakers, and he says for many, politics has simply become a popularity contest. Li says he wants Taiwanese people to think about what democracy and freedom really mean. Taiwan's next presidential vote will fall on the 10th anniversary of the 2014 Sunflower Movement. It'll be up to voters then to decide how the protest's legacy survives. Andy Xue, Eastern Chen, Stash Butler for Taiwan Plus. 27 Chinese warplanes and four naval ships were spotted around Taiwan on Wednesday. That's according to the country's military. The Defense Ministry says that 11 of the planes breached Taiwan's Air Defense Identification Zone, or ADIZ. This area is not the country's airspace, but serves as a security buffer zone where aircraft must identify themselves. China often sends warplanes into Taiwan's ADIZ as a form of political pressure. The incursions come just a day after the U.S. announced more weapons deals with Taiwan. The U.S. has published the final version of a bill that will see Taiwan receive 10 billion U.S. dollars in security grants over the next five years. Under the annual National Defense Authorization Act, Taiwan will receive 2 billion U.S. dollars every year from 2023 to 2027. The money is conditional on Taiwan increasing its own defense spending. The bill also authorizes a 100 million U.S. dollar regional stockpile of weapons for Taiwan in the event of conflict. The final version does not include more controversial proposals made by U.S. lawmakers during negotiations. Those include Washington designating Taiwan as a major non-NATO ally. The bill is expected to pass Congress and be signed into law this month. The U.S. has proposed supplying Taiwan with advanced Patriot missiles. That's according to a Bloomberg report. The weapons would be an upgrade to an earlier arms package. Patriot missiles are considered an integral part of the country's missile defense. But what exactly are they? To find out, our reporter Jaime Yokan spoke to Xu Tianran, a missile expert at the Vienna-based Open Nuclear Network. Can you first tell us what are Patriot missiles and why they are important for Taiwan's missile defense? Patriot missile, it started as a long-range anti-aircraft missile system. And when we say pack, it means a Patriot 
advanced capabilities. So now Taiwan has two irritations of this Patriot missile systems. The one uh, that's been uh, allowed to be shoot in Taiwan islands during military drills are the Pac-2. And Pac-2 has some limited capabilities against ballistic missiles. Its primary role is to hit air bracing targets, meaning like uh, aircraft and cruise missiles and other targets that are powered by a jet engine. Uh, the other irritation is called the Pac-3. They are uh, dedicated uh, anti-ballistic missile systems. So the difference between the Pac-2 and Pac-3 mainly is that Pac-3, they have no warhead. So uh, they only kill the uh, incoming targets with their uh, kinetic uh, energies. That means uh, in order to intercept the missile, they must hit in the incoming missile directly. There are some estimates that the Patriot missiles themselves can defend about 70% of the population of Taiwan uh, on the main island. Is this true? And, and do we know what the system protects in general? It starts from Taipei first, first three batteries in Taipei, and then gradually uh, more batteries are coming and deployed uh, uh, for the populations and infrastructures in the uh, middle of the island and uh, the southern part of the Island and uh, yeah, as you said, all the batteries they are like positioned on the west side of the island because that's where the most people live and where most of the important infrastructures are located. So uh, people or infrastructures on the other side of the central mountains, uh, you cannot probably defend because the terrains have blocked the radar's line of sight, and that is why. so. The range circles is only for reference. They should probably covers like uh, seventy percent of the population, meaning that the Pax ray uh, are deployed in such a manner that it can protect the most densely populated areas of Taiwan. That was Jaime Ocon speaking to Xu Tianran of the Open Nuclear Network in Vienna. Not many people become record breakers after sixty. But as Rick Glatt reports, the powerlifting metal hall of a university lecturer from southwestern Taiwan has left many in awe. Go, go, go. Yes, go, go. Wow. 61-year-old wow. Li Tai Wei, a law and human rights lecturer, just made history, breaking records in powerlifting. Defying expectations, Lee took all four gold medals in the women's 69 kilogram weight class for her age group at the Asian Classic Powerlifting Championship in Dubai, much to the admiration of her students at Taiwan's National Jiayi University. Lee took up powerlifting just three years ago, and with the help of her son as coach and a lot of brute effort, she has become a leader in a sport often dominated by young men. Champion is Li Sai Wei of Chinese Taipei. But Taiwan netizens have found the win surprising and encouraging. And proof that age is, after all, just a number. Ethan Pan and Rick Lauert for Taiwan Plus. A new exhibition in Taipei is displaying clothes worn by survivors of sexual assault. The university students behind it say they want to end the culture of victim blaming that people face when they report their attack. Stash Butler brings us this report. Bright surroundings with dark stories inside. Songshan Cultural and Creative Park's new show, The Ideal Victim, has a serious message at its heart. It's often the first question victims of sexual assault are asked. What were you wearing when it happened? This exhibition aims to undermine that question by answering it. Every piece of clothing on display here was worn by a survivor of sexual violence at the time of their attack. From a school uniform to swimwear, each item has a tale to tell. Its size, a painful reminder of the owner's age. Curator Vivian Liao tells one of those stories the story of a girl called May. 
，这个妹她是小学的时候被认识的学长侵犯，然后她跟老师反映之后，老师也是呃比较没有那么积极的处理，所以她隔天还是就是装作没事一样的去学校。May's story is just one of dozens collected by Vivian and her team, who are mostly university students. Assistant designer Silana Chen, herself a victim of assault, says collecting them has taken a toll. When I was in the exhibition, I often went to the bathroom to have a bath because the uncomfortable feeling would always come back. But I think I should face it and accept it. Today, the exhibition is about Wu Ziying's organization, the Modern Women's Foundation, is sponsoring the exhibition. She says victim blaming makes the problem of sexual violence worse. When we are constantly putting all the responsibility on the victim, we also have created this whole society in which women are being victimized by the situation. In Taiwan, women and girls make up about 80% of sexual assault victims, and boys and men, about 20%. Where the gender of the attacker is known, about 90% are male and 10% are female. The number of assaults reported has changed dramatically over the last 14 years, rising from about 7,000 in 2008 to 12,000 in 2012, before falling again to about 8,000 last year. But statistics only tell one part of the story. The exhibition is a chance for people to talk openly, without judgment, about an issue often cloaked in guilt and shame. Guest speaker Annie Zhang says it took her years to tell her story. In 2012, I was in the last year in my college and I experienced the rap in the campus. After so many years, Taiwan is still facing like the same situation. There are still rape happens uh, like frequently and it's not like something far away from our daily life like my friends experience that i experience that I, and some of my students also experience that breaking the silence can help teach people about the scale of the problem but it's not just about education for annie jan sharing her story is a way to heal what i do is not just for others half of the reason is for myself because I was treated badly and I couldn't do anything for me in the past. But now I can do something I think is right. The Ideal Victims exhibition undercuts the notions of victim blaming or shaming someone for how they dress. But more than that, it's a space for survivors to come to terms with what happened to speak up, and to help give others the courage to do the same. Karma Xu, Sandy Chi, and Stash Butler for Taiwan Plus. Indonesia this week criminalized sex outside marriage and cohabitation, dealing a blow to rights and freedoms in the country. Activists say the law could be used to unfairly target same-sex couples, as hostility to the country's LGBTQ community has grown in recent years. But there's one place in Indonesia that offers a rare oasis of acceptance, a school for transgender people. Louise Watt reports. Learning to read the Quran at a unique boarding school in Indonesia. It's an Islamic academy for transgender men and women. It's run by Shinta Ratri, who wants to enable other trans women to study Islam because she understands what it is to struggle with gender transition. Ratri says faith can be a source of comfort for many transgender people. Her school on the outskirts of the city of Yogyakarta has been running since 2008. It has had its opponents. It was once forced to close for months after pressure from a hardline Islamist group. 
compared to other Muslim-majority countries like Qatar, host of the World Cup, where gay sex is criminalized, homosexuality isn't outlawed in Indonesia, except in one province, Aceh, which has Sharia law. But there's been a rise in religious conservatism, and protesters have come out against the national government's recent move to criminalize sex outside of marriage and cohabitation. They object to what they see as an intrusion into their privacy. The law will cover Indonesians and foreigners, but complaints can only be made by a person's spouse, parents or children. Activists say the law, which isn't due to come into effect until 2025, could be used to target LGBT people. They already face discrimination and hostility, a reality that makes Rattray School even more important to its 60 students, offering them a safe space to be who they are. Hidup itu memang penuh penuh warna dan kita harus saling bisa menghormati, bisa saling uh, toleransi sebatas tidak saling mengganggu seperti itu. In a country where many LGBT people feel they need to hide their identity to protect themselves, students here hope this message of acceptance will spread beyond the school's walls. Ricky and Louise Watt for Taiwan Plus. Indonesia has released Umar Patek, known as the Bali Bomber, after only serving half of a 20-year sentence. Patek was found guilty of making bombs that killed over 200 people in two nightclubs in Bali in 2002. He was a former member of an Al-Qaeda-linked Islamist extremist terrorist group based in Indonesia and was involved in a series of church bombings in the year 2000. The Indonesian government says that Patek will be required to join a mentoring program until 2030. There has been outrage from the victim's families about how Patek's sentence was reduced. South Korea's government is ordering striking truckers in the steel and petrochemical industries to go back to work. The order covers over 10,000 drivers in those industries. It's an expansion of an order from last week on nearly 3,000 striking cement truckers. This is the first time the South Korean government has exercised this power. It also threatens penalties for anyone intimidating workers or preventing them from returning to their jobs. Local labor groups are asking the United Nations International Labor Organization to see if the order breaches labor rights. The workers began striking in late November to demand a permanent minimum freight rate system. They say that such a system would ensure safety and help offset rising fuel costs. Normally, when you think of farms, you probably picture large fields in the countryside. But a company in the UK is creating farms underground in the city. Eric Gao reports. Beneath this London tube station, an unusual sight. Vegetables growing in trays and without any soil. This is the first facility set up by Zero Carbon Farms. And what we do here is we sustainably grow fresh produce in former World War II air raid shelters. Over 30 meters underground, the company is using hydroponics technology. That means the plants aren't grown in soil, but in carpet material soaked with nutrient-rich water. This technique uses far fewer resources than traditional farming methods and means the crops aren't at the mercy of the weather. We use renewable energy, we use recirculating water, and we're able to grow the crops 365 days a year with little impact on the environment. Zero Carbon Farm says its methods use up to 90% less water and 95% less fertilizer than normal farms, but the crops still flourish. Yields and their efficiencies and their growing times are as optimized as possible, and that also means that we get incredibly nutritious, very, very tasty crops that, you know, have very long shelf life, so you get less food waste because of things like that. This is just the first of the company's farms. Its products are already being sold at major UK retailers and restaurants. Zero Carbon plans to double growing space in 2023. You know, the future is very, very bright for this industry. I think that what really is kind of going to be the pivotal or find a fundamental pivot point is the right application of technology, uh, as well as, you know, a broader kind of, um, a broader range of research into different cultivation styles, different parameter controls. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I'm very, very excited and looking forward to it. Produce grown in farms like this in the heart of the city can reach a diner's plate in as little as two hours. It's about giving consumers the freshest produce possible without anyone having to get their hands dirty. Damon Lin and Eric Gao for Taiwan Plus. 
Taiwan's Agriculture Ministry says it has detected H5N1 bird flu in the south of the country. That follows an outbreak of the virus last month on a duck farm in the northeast. The virus is brought to Taiwan by migratory birds. Contact with the feces of infected birds can lead to outbreaks on poultry farms. The Agriculture Ministry has tested samples from both wild birds and farmed poultry to track the virus and prevent its spread. It says current cases are isolated, but that more will need to be done to contain the virus over the winter, as more migratory birds come into contact with poultry. Uh Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus News. Remember to download the Taiwan Plus app for more stories from Taiwan and around the world. Finally today, we leave you with images of Mexico City blooming for Christmas with traditional poinsettia flowers. I'm Erica Liu. Take care and see you next time.